Now I'd like to take a break from looking at factor rings and I'd like to go back to looking at ideals um, and some properties of ideals that can be satisfied that are stronger than just being an ideal. And we will see how this relates to factor rings towards the end of this uh, video and in the next. So a proper ideal I of a commutative ring R is said to be prime if whenever you take two elements of the larger ring R, and it happens to be the case that the product of these two elements belongs to the ideal, then one or the other of those elements that you took has to also belong to the ideal. Now, no pun intended, but the idea of a prime ideal is an attempt to generalize the notion of a prime number among the integers. So let's start with this lemma. I mean, this is really where it came about. The ideal nz in the integers is a prime ideal if and only if the number n is prime. So we'll get to the proof in a minute, but really we want to capture this very special property that the integers have. This prime number is such a special property and we have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic uh, and, and prime numbers are such an item of study in number theory and abstract algebra that many people have tried to generalize the properties and the notions behind a prime, put their finger on what it really means to be a prime number so that we can interpret this in different contexts. So our first lemma here is saying that one way we can generalize, at least within the ring of integers, the idea of a prime number is by saying that the associated ideal, a prime number times the integers, is prime according to this definition. So let's take a look at the proof of this lemma. Let's begin by supposing that a and b are integers and that their product happens to belong to the ideal uh, nz. So what this means is that the number n divides the number ab. First, let's assume that n is a prime number. If n is a prime number, then by Euclid's lemma, we know that this prime number divides one or the other. It either divides A or it divides B. Whichever number it is, A or B, that happens to be divisible by N, belongs to the ideal NZ. And so this shows this one direction. If we start out by assuming that the number N is a prime number, then the ideal N times Z is a prime ideal. Because whenever we take the product, of two arbitrary integers and get it belonging to the ideal, then one of those integers we started with also has to belong to the ideal, either A or B. Now let's work on uh, the other direction. So let's suppose that N is not a prime number and let's build an example to show that we can find integers, A and B, whose product belongs to the ideal NZ, but where neither one of those two elements has to belong to the ideal. So let's assume that n is not prime, and let's let p be a prime divisor of n. Uh, the reason that I can do that, if uh, I want to assume that n is not 1 here, if n is equal to 1, then the ideal nz is going to be the whole ring z, and we're not going to have a proper ideal. So let's start out with a number n that's not prime and is bigger than 1, uh, and let's let p be a prime that divides n. Then let's take a to be equal to that prime p, and let's let b be the quantity n over p. Now I've written b as a fraction, n over p, but really b is an integer because we've started with a prime that does divide n. And it should also be clear, if we make this selection for a and b, then the product of a and b is just the number n. Now we're assuming in this case that n is not a prime number, and that means that a is something that's strictly smaller than n. It's a divisor of n, but it's not quite as big because it's prime and n is not. And this also means that b is a number bigger than 1 because I've started with the number n. I've divided it by p. Uh, n is not p, so that's going to have to be bigger than 1. And consequently, what we can conclude is that a and b are both numbers that are bigger than 1 and strictly smaller than n. What this means is that both a and b are numbers, and they're strictly in between 0 times n and 1 times n. And therefore, there's no way that they are multiples of n, and then neither of them can belong to the ideal n times z.
Now, let's continue with this. Um, let's look at some more examples. So we've seen one example. If the ring that we're working in is the ring of integers, then the ideal n times z happens to be a prime ideal. Let's work with a different example. If we take the ring z adjoined x, then the ideal generated by x happens to be a prime ideal. Let's prove this. So the first thing we need to check, which is kind of hidden in the definition of a prime ideal, but we do need to check that the ideal generated by x is a proper ideal of z adjoined x. And this is true, there are certainly elements of z adjoined x that are not a multiple of x, a polynomial multiple of x, uh, so we do have a proper ideal. And now let's think about what happens if we take two arbitrary polynomials in our ring, multiply them together, and get an element of the ideal generated by x. So let's call those elements f and g. Because we are assuming that their product fg belongs to the ideal generated by x, what this means is that the constant term of this product has to be zero. Now if we write out more formally what f and g might look like, let's write f as a sub n x to the n plus so on and so forth plus a one x plus a naught, and let's write g as maybe some different leading power, uh, b sub m x to the m. We keep on adding terms all the way out through b one x plus b naught. When we take these two polynomials and multiply them together, the way that we get the constant term in the product is by multiplying the constants of the polynomial. So the constant term in fg is going to be a0 times b0, and this is just a plain old integer. Now we know that the integers are an integral domain, and so a0 times b0 being equal to 0 implies that one of a0 or b0 has to be 0 themselves, because we don't have any 0 divisors in an integral domain. Now whichever one it is, if it happens to be the case that a0 is 0, then what this means is that f is a polynomial with no constant term, and I can factor an x out of there, so f is a multiple of x. If it's the other way around, then the same is true of g. Right? And we'll see that g belongs to the ideal generated by x. And in either way, we've used the definition of a prime ideal uh, to show that the ideal generated by x is prime. Now it's also important to have a non-example. There are plenty of ideals that are not prime. So if we change our ring just from z adjoined x to z mod 4 adjoined x, then the exact same ideal, the ideal generated by x, is not prime. Now when we want to show that this ideal is not prime, all we have to do is provide a counterexample. So we have to find two elements, a and b, that belong to the ring z mod 4 adjoined x where their product happens to be in the ideal, but where neither element belongs to the ideal. So for this example, I'm going to choose my a and b, my elements of z mod 4, to be the same. And I'm going to look at what happens when I take the element x plus 2, and I square it. I FOIL this out, I get x squared plus 4x plus 4. Uh, both the 4x and the 4, ter 4 term are secretly 0. So when I take x plus 2 and I square it in z mod 4, z adjoined x, I just get the element x squared, which is clearly a multiple of x. It's x times x. So x plus 2 times x plus 2 belongs to the ideal generated by x, but x plus 2 does not belong to the ideal generated by x, since x plus 2 is certainly not a multiple of x. Now, the last thing I want to discuss in terms of prime ideals is this really helpful theorem, this theorem that ties a property that an ideal can satisfy uh, back to a property that a factor ring can satisfy. And this theorem can be hugely helpful in proving that an ideal is actually a prime ideal uh, in a way other than just using the straightforward definition. So the theorem is this. Suppose R is a commutative ring with unity. Then R mod I, the factor ring R mod I, is an integral domain if and only if the ideal is prime. So if I had an ideal and I wanted to know if it was prime or not, one way I could test this is by looking at the factor ring r mod i and checking to see if I have an integral domain or not. Now here I'd actually like to walk through the proof of this a little bit. So here's the big long proof. Let's go through slowly. First, suppose that r mod i is an integral domain. What we need to show is that the ideal i is prime. 
So let's do this here according to the definition. Let's take elements A and B in the ring R, and let's suppose that their product belongs to I. Then the coset AB plus I is equal to the coset I, since AB is an element of I. And yet, according to the rules of factor rings, the coset AB plus I is equal to the product of the two cosets A plus I and B plus I. Since AB plus I is equal to I, substitution gives us that the product of the cosets A plus I and B plus I is just equal to the ideal I. Now we're assuming that r mod i is an integral domain, and what we've done is we've taken two cosets, and we've multiplied them together, and we've gotten the zero element of our particular ring. What this means is that there are no zero divisors, and so one of the things that I multiply, one of the cosets I chose in this multiplication must have been the zero element of the factor ring. That is, the coset a plus i either needs to be equal to i, or the coset b plus i needs to be equal to i. When we have these two cosets, you know, suppose for instance that b a plus i is equal to i. a is an element of the coset a plus i, and if that's equal to i, then this means that a is an element of i. And similarly with b in place of i. And so what that is, this tells us is that either a belongs to i or b belongs to i which is what we needed according to the definition to show that I was a prime ideal. So up to here we've now completed one direction of our if and only if statement. We've started by assuming that r mod i is an integral domain, and we've proven that i is prime. Now we need to attack this the other way around. Let not, let's now suppose that the ideal i is prime, and let's prove that r mod i is an integral domain. To do that, what we're going to do is we're going to start with two cosets, a plus i and b plus i, we're going to multiply them together and assume that we get the zero element of our factor ring. And what we're going to show is that one of the things we selected had to be zero, so that we don't have any zero divisors, and that's going to justify that we have an integral domain. Now, we're, so here we are, we're assuming that the coset a plus i, when multiplied by the coset b plus i, gives us the coset i. As we know how to compute the product of things in factor rings, as a plus i times b plus i should be equal to a b plus i in this factor ring, what we conclude is that a b plus i is equal to i, which tells us that the element a b is an element to the coset i. Now we're assuming in this direction that i is a prime ideal, and we've taken a b and it's an element of i, so according to the definition this means that a belongs to i or b belongs to i. Whichever one it is, it follows that either a plus i is equal to i or b plus i is equal to i. And what this means is, if the coset a plus i is equal to i, then the coset a plus i is the zero element of r mod i. Or similarly, if b plus i is equal to i, then the coset b plus i is the zero element of r mod i. Since one of these things must be true, we've shown that the only way to multiply two cosets together and get the zero coset is for one of those cosets to be the zero coset itself, and that's establishing that R mod I is an integral domain.